Good afternoon or good morning or good evening. Uh, my name is Mark Mamagonian. I am the Director of Academic Affairs at the National Association for Armenian Studies and Research, Nasser. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's program, Khachkars as Worldwide Witnesses of Armenian History, Spirituality and Art. This is the second of a planned three events that uh, mark the 15th anniversary of the final phase of the systematic destruction in 2005 by the Azerbaijani army of thousands of remaining Khachkars in Juha, Old Julfa in Nakhichevan, uh, effectively eliminating the last remnants of Armenian cultural presence in that region. Uh, the programs focus both on that event and on the Khachkars of Julfa, as well as the Khachkar in general. The first took place in July, and the second now, uh, rather the, the third, now looks like it may happen uh, early next year, but we will announce that as, as soon as we have the details. Um, the reason for the uncertainty is that the Armenia-based scholars who will be participating in the third program have their hands rather full at the moment, trying to deal with the imminent threat to Armenian churches and other monuments in Nagorno-Karabakh or Artsakh, uh, as there's every reason to be seriously concerned about those that are in areas presently under the control of Azerbaijan and the uncertain future that they face, to say the least, uh, as we are once again, I think, reminded that such seemingly distinct subject areas as art history, ancient history, and current day geopolitics are in fact inseparable from each other. So we did not want these programs only to focus on the astonishing act of cultural vandalism that took place 15 years ago or that was completed 15 years ago, uh, but also again to talk about Khachkars in their proper art historical context as works of art, as repositories of history, as objects of religious devotion, and as somehow recognizable embodiments of some sense of Armenian culture itself around the world. I want to express Nasser's gratitude to the Dadurian Foundation for supporting these programs, and I also want to thank the co-sponsor of today's program, the Kalust Gulbenkian Chair in Armenian Studies at the University of Oxford. Some time ago when I approached our esteemed friend and colleague, Professor Van Lint, who holds the Gulbenkian chair at Oxford about collaborating on such a program, we of course were thinking of it as an in-person event. Well, that was then and this is now, so we're delighted under any circumstances to work with Professor Van Lint and the wonderful scholars we have here today on our panel. Please bear in mind that if you wish to submit a question for the panel, you must do so using the Q&A function on Zoom Please tr strive to keep them short and on subject, and we will get to as many as time permits. And with that, I will hand things off to Professor Theo von Lint, the Kalust Gulbenkian Professor of Armenian Studies at the Orient Oriental Institute, University of Oxford. Theo. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mark, um, uh, for your uh, uh, kind words. Um, I would like um, to welcome everyone who joined today's uh, panel. Uh, uh, um, for the coming uh, three presentations. I would like in my turn uh, also like to thank uh, Nasser and in particular uh, Mark as friend and colleague who uh, approached uh, me uh, with the idea of organizing this panel and uh, which now has to take place um, online. Um, we um, would both, I think, like to uh, thank the three speakers of today, um, Professor Patrick Donabedian, Dr. David Zakarian, and Professor Christina Maranci, for their willingness to present their thoughts about different aspects of the Armenian cross stones or Khachkars. As Mark mentioned, the direct occasion for this panel is the commemoration of the last phase of deliberate destruction, now 15 years ago, of the thousands of Khachkars forming the remnant of the large Armenian cemetery of the city of Jura in Nakhichevan by Azerbaijan. This act of cultural annihilation represented the culmination of a longer process of erasure of Armenian cultural heritage on the territory of Nakhichevan. It is superfluous to say that such attempts at consigning to oblivion a rich strand of humanity's heritage um, 
goes against the interests of humanity as a whole, let alone that of the people whose cultural expressions is, are destroyed. It also deprives those living on the territory in the present day of their territory's history and thereby of an understanding of it, its culture and the people that once lived there and left these testimonies of their presence. The erasure of cultural heritage and the denial of the historical presence of those who brought it into being is to be utterly rejected. Scholarship can shine a light on the cultural heritage that despite attempts at erasure or distortion and despite its partial physical annihilation continues to flourish. In honor of the Hajj cars that once graced the banks of the Araks outside of the town of Jura, Today's panel gathers under the title Khachkars as worldwide witnesses of Armenian culture, spirituality, and art. Each of these three aspects will be touched upon in the presentations we will hear in a moment. Khachkars are a striking element of Armenian culture, and there were many of them in historic Armenia. And today there are still many in the Republic of Armenia, in Artsakh, and in the worldwide Armenian diaspora, where they often assume particular significance as a connection to Armenian culture and to the land of Armenia. They thus bear witness of Armenians' historical vicissitudes. Their spirituality flows forth from their main image, the cross, the most identifiable symbol of the Christian faith, as Professor Dikran Kuyumjan calls it in one of his texts on Khachkars. The cross as the sign of the passion of Christ and in its empty representation of his resurrection is a focal point of Christians in their religious life as they ne navigate life on earth and commemorate those who have passed away. The artistic aspect of the Khachkars is evident from even a superficial glance at them. Um, I, I can say for myself, uh, you look at them and you're hooked. That at least was my, uh, was my uh, experience. Uh, they are often intricate and ornate and contain a series of features that are both symbols as well as pleasing to the eye and to the mind. Their importance was recognized in 2010 when UNESCO recognized Khachkars as global cultural heritage, the Patrimoine Mondial. I will briefly introduce each of the three speakers before they begin their talk, uh, each as they start their talk. Professor Patrick Donabetian will speak first, followed by Dr. David Zakarian, and then Professor Christina Maranci. Dr. Patrick Donabetian is Associate Professor Emeritus at the University of Aix, Marseille, and a globally renowned art historian and author of many books and articles on Armenian art and architecture. Many will be well acquainted with the beautifully produced large format tome he co-authored with Jean-Michel Thierry, in 1987, entitled Les Arts Arméniens, an indispensable survey volume, and with the equally attractive and erudite volume on Armenian churches of the 7th century, L'Age d'Or de l'Architecture Arménienne, the Golden Age of Armenian Architecture, which was published in 2008, and many more contributions on Armenian architecture, such as on the Church of Yerlehuk and on Khachkars as well and on uh, the vicissitudes of Armenians in uh, Karabakh and the situation in Karabakh. He has been active as well in the protection of Armenian cultural heritage, promoting their preservation and study. As Mark said, something that is unfortunately more than ever uh, actual today. His presentation today is entitled Small Wall Khachkars, a type proper to diaspora communities. Patrick, may I hand over to you? The Khachkar or cross stone is a well-known form of Armenian art emblematic of this culture. Art is one of the clearest expressions of Armenian spirituality and Christology. But when we say Khachkar, we understand mainly the type of tall Khachkars standing isolated or in groups, often but not always in cemeteries, in front of graves. This monumental khachkar is, as well as the churches, always oriented, especially in its funerary use. It is always turned to the east with the image of the cross as a tree of life sculpted 
on its western side. It began its development in the ninth century and has never interrupted it since. Its popularity was so great that uh, it has diversified into several subtypes, subtypes such as the Vornapag Khachkaj or Khachkaramatur, the Chapel Khachkaj, the rows of Khachkaj in front of tombs in a monastery or inside a mausoleum, and the crosses carved on a rock following the Khachkaz model. But it is less known that simultaneously with the monumental Khachkaz, approximately in the last decades of the ninth century, in Armenia, a minor type of Khachkaz has been elaborated. The stone plates belonging to this second category also show the image of a cross, but they have smaller dimensions and are intended to be inserted in the facades, only the external facades of churches or civil buildings. Sometimes they are deprived of inscriptions. Therefore, their only message is the glorification of the cross, represented as always in Armenian art as a tree of life. More often, inscriptions carved on them add a votive or commemorative content, which can be linked to a donation. In Armenia, this minor type remains relatively secondary compared to the huge number of monumental khachkars. On the contrary, in the communities of Armenian diaspora, the second category can be considered as very characteristic because it is almost exclusively the only one attested. Outside Armenia, examples of such kind of small mural khachkars appear first in the 12th century in Cilicia and Jerusalem. In Cilicia, this Armenia with an Armenian monarchy and a mainly Armenian population, the conditions did not correspond to diaspora criteria. That's why Cilicia must be seen as a bridge between the, na the national tradition and the new culture created in diaspora communities. In Cilicia, only eight or nine small plates with cross are known at, that, at this time. Among them, the most remarkable are two plates inserted on the, on the eastern facade of uh, the remains of a church in Hromkla, the patriarchal seat of Cilician Armenia. These plates are datable to the second half of the 12th century. Although the crosses have been destroyed, one can easily appreciate the high quality of these works and their originality. The same type of interlaces on the rectangular frame can be seen on two other Cilician works at Korikos and Papyron. An uh, interesting trait appears on two Cilician khachkas, probably of the 12th century, a nail in the center of the cross as a sign of consecration. This feature unknown in Armenia is present as we shall see in Jerusalem at the same period. In Jerusalem, there are 287 examples of small 
mural khachkars from the 12th to the 19th century. In the world of the Armenian diaspora, Jerusalem stands separately as an exceptional place of pilgrimage. The oldest productions form a homogeneous uh, stylistic group of the mid 12th century, distinguished among other things by the presence once again of a nail at the center of the cross. As we said, it is a sign of consecration. A second group can be easily identified around works from the mid 15th century. These pieces are characterized by clear and fine images, a very neat treatment, a very regular geometric ribbon frame. Above the cross, a band of small medallions with crosses or rosettes, and under the cross, another band with some lines of inscriptions. Besides Cilicia and Jerusalem, the category of small mural khachkars is used in various diaspora centers. Among these colonies, New Julfa in Isfahan, Iran, with 382 plates of the 17th, 18th century, and Crimea with around 200 plates from the 14th to the 18th centuries, distinguish themselves by the number of plates with cross. Far behind them, Aleppo has 32 plates, Lviv has six pieces. Examples of this category can, can be mentioned in several other places, Constantinople, Trebizond, Ukraine, Georgia, Famagusta in Cyprus, Iraq, Cairo in Egypt, and there are cer certainly still many that remain to be identified. All these examples in foreign countries clearly demonstrate the specificity of this type. These are small, usually thin plates, often in marble, which do not stand isolated, oriented towards the east, like the monumental khachkars of Armenia, but are mounted into the surface of walls and therefore are deprived of proper orientation. Their decoration presents mainly the same kind of cross tree of life, but in a markedly simplified version. Their main and direct meaning is, of course, the glor gl glorification of the cross. But as for the tall stelas of Armenia, the functions of these small plates are diverse, funerary, commemorative, votive, memorial. The inscriptions carved on most of them contain a prayer for the salvation of the soul and for the memory of the believers mentioned in them. In the case of Jerusalem plates, these are mainly pilgrims. In the other cases, they are ordinary parishioners and priests, as well as members of their family. Among the reasons for the choice in diaspora conditions of such a modest form, one may probably consider the following factors. A reduction of material means, a loss of technical and artistic skills, difficulty of erecting relatively high stairs standing isolated, 
and perhaps the main reason, a wish of discretion, especially in Catholic and Muslim environment, where external signs of foreign cults could be undesirable or even simply forbidden. In the wide geography of Armenian dispersion, a significant place belongs to the Crimean Khachkars. The large Armenian population of Crimea was very active in the production of small mural Khachkars in the 14th and 15th centuries and until the 18th century. The main center was the town of nowadays Theodosia, or in Russian, Theodosia, administrative capital of the Genoese Crimea, with a numerous Armenian community. The Crimean production is particularly important for the Black Sea Basin and for Central and Eastern Europe because it has exerted its influence on the Armenian centers of the region. Before presenting the Crimean production of small Khashkars, we must note that the Armenian community of Kaffa is the only one in the whole diaspora which has preserved, at least in some examples, the national tradition of monumental Khachkars standing alone. Two such stelas have been inserted into the western facade of the narthex of St. Sarkis Church in Kaffa. One of them is dated 1761. The second one, markedly bigger, is probably of the same period. These Khachkars, of course, uh, originally standing, were partly inspired by the famous elongated stelas of the end of the 16th, the very beginning of the 17th century in the cemetery of uh, Hin, uh, old Julfa, Hin Jura in Armenian. Uh, the famous uh, cemetery uh, in Nakhichevan, which was recently destroyed by the Azerbaijanis uh, authorities. Except for these rare and late cases, the Crimean, Crimean Armenians have chosen the same path as all their compatriots abroad. They have carved small mural Khachkars. Most of them are in the medieval town of Kaffa. More than 100, 100 plates are preserved, mainly in St. Sarkis Church. The small Khachkar mounted in the north wall of its narthex, dated 1356, is the oldest among the, the, the date pieces that have reached us. Many of these plates are in marble. Some are made of limestone or sandstone. The dimensions are relatively modest from 30 to 90 centimeters high and from 20 to 45 centimeters wide. The pieces detached from the walls on which they were fixed show a reduced thickness, generally for, from five to seven centimeters. In some rare and late cases, the height may reach 120 centimeters, for example, on the plate of 1698, dedicated to the memory of the painter Nikoros Tsarkaraj. In decorative compositions, 
along with the traditional repertoire, clearly simplified and somewhat rustic, there are also features of fantasy. On some plates from the 1420s, we find an original motif, a design of heart with a lily in its center interlaced on the edges of the cross branches. As we shall see further, the same hearts are carved on one of the Lviv plates dating back precisely to 1427. At the foot of the cross in Crimea, mainly in Kaffa, a rectangular fragment of interlace is often represented. It is known in several traditions from Far East to Celtic Europe under the name of Knot of Infinity. This motif in such a treatment is not found on other groups of Khachkars, neither in Armenia nor in diaspora, diaspora, except for the Central and East European uh, colonies and the Crimean influence. One can see here a reinterpretation of plant and geometric motifs placed under the cross, probably to evoke the idea of eternal life on some monumental khachkas of Armenia of early times. Here you can see two examples uh, from the 9th, 10th centuries. And here on the right side of the, of the photo, uh, another example with a more, little bit more sophisticated motif from the 11th century. Another free interpretation of all traditions can be seen on Crimean small khachkars. The traditional three-stepped pedestal and the round medallion under the cross are replaced by a tree-lobed arch with an interlace, more or less tall. In the inscriptions carved on, may, on, on many Crimean plates, besides the usual content mentioned above, we find an original feature, which is very rare in Armenia, but is sometimes present on wall khachkas of Jerusalem. The number of sculpted crosses often corresponds to the number of persons named in the inscriptions. Here you can see nine crosses, nine names, and on the, on the, the right side, three crosses, three names. In the collections still preserved in Crimea and especially in Kaffa, the presence of homogeneous uh, series makes probable the existence of workshops specialized in the production of this kind of small khachkars. Apart from kaffa, Armenian plates with a cross can be found in several other places of the Crimean Peninsula. The most enigmatic collection is on the site of the fortified Genoese port of Sugdeya or Sudak. There are here several tens of them. These are modest, rather rough blocks deprived of inscriptions, obviously displaced, scattered on the walls without order, sometimes with a row of two, three, or four crosses. Due to the extreme simplicity of the crosses, 
until very recently, there was no certainty as to their national attribution until Armenian inscriptions were found on two of them. Here you can see the first one with a partly preserved inscription and the second one, unfortunately, with only a little fragment of the inscription still uh, visible on the right side, the upper right side of the plate. Let's uh, observe now very briefly the traces of the, of the Crimean influence on other Armenian colonies of the region, beginning from Galicia and its capital, the town of Lviv or Lvov. In the Armenian cathedral of Lvov, one finds six small mural khachkars. They are made of marble and alabaster. Judging from the inscriptions of three of them and from their homogeneity, all date back from the 15th century. The dimensions are very small. One, however, is a little bigger the one on, on the left side of the photo. It distinguishes itself by its decoration and techniques. It is probably the oldest. It bears the date 1427. Several traits, the proportions of the cross, the central square with sharp lily-like tips, the heart pattern already mentioned on the end of the cross branches. All this reveals a deep kinship with the Crimean works. Such a narrow similarity allows us to suppose that the, the Lviv plate may have been brought from Kaffa. This reminds us of the Crimean origin of a part of the Lviv Armenians, including the founders of the cathedral, uh, the cathedral of Lviv. The other five plates are so intimately related to each other, they have so specific characteristics that the hypothesis of a common local production, in other teams, in other terms, a local workshop, seems very probable. At the same time, at the same time, they also present features of Crimean influence. The main one being the interlaced knots under the cross. Another typically Crimean motif can be seen on one of the Lviv plates the Agnus Dei, the lamb holding a cross. This theme, rare in Armenia, appeared in Cilician art at, at the end of the 12th century and was particularly popular among the Crimean Armenians. In Podolia, in the town fortress of Kamenets Podolsky, not very far from Lviv, more to the, to the west. Uh, so in Kamenets Podolsky, among the, the remnants of Armenian monuments, three plates with crosses have been preserved. One of them is dated 1548. It is close to Crimean Khachkars by the form of the three-lobed frame, the interlaced ends of the cross branches and the design of the wound leaves on both sides of the left cross. Another Khachkar fr from Kamenets Podolsky 
can be seen in the History Museum of, of Lviv. It is in sandstone and shows two interesting features, a two sloped frame and an inscription which runs continuously along the edges of the stone as if it were on the, the binding of a manuscript. These two features are present not in Crimea, but on new Julfa cross plates of the 17th century. So this unexpectedly reveals another link, this time between two Armenian communities much further apart, Kamenets Podolsky in Podolia, Ukraine, and Isfahan in Iran. Now let's go to the town of Belgorod Dniestrovsky, the ancient Ackerman in Bessarabia, now in Odessa Oblast, uh, Ukraine. Among the traces of Armenian presence, three plates of marble are kept inside the Armenian church of St. Oxentius. One dated 1446 is richly adorned with two crosses in an elegant vegetal decoration. Here, both composition and ornamentation find direct parallels on kaffa plates of the same period. The link with Crimea is so close that once again, the hypothesis of a transfer from kaffa seems plausible. It was even more unexpected and expected to find traces of Crimean influence on the south shore of the Black Sea by a kind of return to the roots in the region of Pontus in the city of Trebizond. About 10 small khachkas are inserted in the walls of St. Savior Church in the ruined Armenian monastery called in Turkish Kaimakle Monastery. These sculptures with their knot plated under the cross and the tree lobed pedestal are very close to plates produced in Kaffa in the 14th, 15th centuries. It is likely that the workshops in Crimea did not only provide models, but could even export their works, not only to the north of the, of the Black Sea, but also to its south shore. This brief survey of small khachkas from various communities of the Armenian diaspora was aimed at giving a general idea of an interesting group of monuments which has remained out of the field of interest of scholars. In this group, an eminent place belongs to the Crimean works. After the Khachkars created in Cilicia, together with those carved in the Holy Land, the plates produced in Kaffa formed an important link between Armenia and the diaspora and played a notable role in the development of this original branch of Armenian art through the Black Sea Basin and Central Eastern Europe. The time was too short and we could only glimpse a much larger dimension that of a large network through exchanges of small khachkas across a wide area, including Europe and the Middle East. Thank you for your attention.
Um, well, so um, uh, I'm sure there will later on there will be questions. Um, I, I would now like to um, uh, to uh, introduce our second speaker, uh, Dr. David Zakarian, who is an associate in Armenian studies at the Faculty of Oriental Studies at the University of Oxford, and until very recently British Academy postdoctoral fellow um, in the same university and junior research fellow at uh, the university's Pembroke College. And David has published a series of articles on the role of women in early Christian Armenian society. And his book, Women Too Were Blessed, the portrayal of women in early Christian Armenian texts, will be published with Brill um, early uh, in the year uh, next month. He is currently preparing a book on Armenian history of the longer 15th century, uh, quite a, a later period, drawing extensively on the testimony of manuscript colophons. And his presentation today focuses on the inscriptions of Armenian Khachkars. David, may I invite you to present? Thank you very much, Theo. Thank you very much, Mark, for inviting me. Uh, let me start by uh, sharing my screen and making sure you could see what I'm going to talk about. Uh, is it visible? Yes. Yep. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, so when I was asked to talk about the Armenian inscriptions on the Khachkars, I uh, tried to remember the first time I saw a uh, Khachkar and I managed to actually read what was written on it. And I uh, realized that it was back in 1993 when as a schoolboy I was walking uh, towards my school and all of a sudden in a very beautiful park in my hometown of Razdan, I saw the following Khachkar. The inscription on it uh, reads Zohvatsneri Hishatakin, R -j -r -g, in memory of the perished um, people, 1993. So it was quite fascinating to see this because I've never been able to read anything, mostly because uh, the inscriptions were in classical Armenian and this one was in modern uh, Armenian. And at the time I assumed that this Khachkar is uh, dedicated to, to the memory of those who died in the first Karabakh war because the wounds were still open, the war was going on. However, recently I discovered that this is a monument to those who perished in the second world war. Uh, in this exactly same year, in uh, 1993, in Thessaloniki, in the city which was going to become my second home for about 10 years, another Khachkar was erected. And as you could see from the inscription in Greek at the bottom of it, uh, it is dedicated to the memory of the Armenians who were killed during the Armenian genocide. And at the top of the Khach, at the top of the cross, uh, you could see the date. Uh, which uh, corresponds to 1442. This date is given according to the medieval Armenian calendar. Uh, and uh, in order to get the exact date, you need to add 551. So it brings us to 1993. As Patrick so insightfully showed that the Khachkars uh, uh, appear actually uh, everywhere where there is an Armenian community. And uh, the two things that bring these two Khachkars together are the fact that they are dedicated to the memory of people who died in, in a war or uh, during the genocide. So it is mostly intended for a commemoration. Another thing that brings these two Khachkars together is the fact that they're both are found in an open space under uh, the sky so uh, it is visible to everyone and usually these things uh, these uh, Khachkars are facing towards the west the one in Hrazdan the early one that I showed you uh, actually was positioned facing towards the west however the one in Thessaloniki uh, for some reason is facing uh, south perhaps because of lack of some knowledge or just trying to um, put it in this uh, area I don't know exactly However, these things bring uh, together the Khachkars that first of all, they are to commemorate something and usually it is to commemorate death. According to um, Hamlet Petrosyan, the person who's done uh, perhaps more than anyone else to bring Armenian Khachkars uh, to the scholarly discourse, the Khachkars can be erected by any believer for any reason. 
which does not contradict the contemporary Christian worldview and morality. And as the prominent scholar highlights, uh, the main reason is death and the, the primary function of Hajkar is securing the salvation of the soul of the deceased person who is mentioned in the inscription. Thus, the inscriptions are really very important and they play uh, uh, one of the uh, most important roles in erecting this uh, Hajkar. Now, the inscriptions usually appear in different positions. Uh, again, uh, from what uh, Patrick showed, you could see it in the different places. I have chosen several ones that, which I um, came across myself. So this one is from Tatev Monastery from the late 14th century. As you could see, the inscription goes around the cross and it is uh, a hajkar which is uh, erected, uh, it, which, is, which forms part of the wall. And then uh, there is also the inscription at the bottom of it. Uh, another way of uh, putting the inscription is to find uh, a space next to the Hajkar. So in this particular case, you could see it on the right of the cross. Uh, on three slabs of the stone, there is a text uh, that asks people who worship at this monastery to commemorate specific people who are named there. And usually a date of the uh, creation of this monument is uh, provided. One of my uh, most favorite ones, and as you could see, a, a gorgeous Khachkar, which uh, can be found in Noravank, uh, comes from the early 14th century. And uh, it is positioned uh, facing west, as it should be, leaning onto the wall of the uh, church. And the inscription itself is in that round, very intricately done, uh, fantastic work of masonry. So I will zoom it in and you could see it. Uh, this was a uh, Khachkar erected by the person who founded the Noravank uh, um, uh, monastery uh, by, uh, it was Prince Burtel and he dedicates this to the memory of his brother Buchta. Now, uh, as you could see, uh, the inscriptions can be in various uh, shapes, in various places, and uh, they are importantly positioned in those uh, areas where people could actually read. While standing in front of the sign of the cross, they could uh, uh, physically see the sign, read it out, and try to commemorate people mentioned there in their prayers. Now, um, according to uh, Hamlet Bedrosian, the traditional inscriptions on a Hajkar contains information about the reason for the erection. Uh, they provide also uh, some details about the circumstances, uh, things like the date, the person, and sometimes also the place from where the Hajkar, the stone itself was brought to this particular uh, area, the purpose, and uh, very often you have the request or the message. Now, uh, to demonstrate this, I have decided to uh, speak about uh, several Khachkars from Dadivang in Artsakh and a few others uh, from Nahijevan. Uh, I'm sure that most of you have seen this image of Dadivang with the Russian peacekeepers now uh, trying to protect the monastery. Unfortunately, a couple of uh, days ago, um, uh, something uh, really unpleasant uh, started to happen and I hope it won't lead to anything uh, serious, but you never know. So uh, the Azerbaijani government has sent to the monastery a, an, Udi, uh, an Udi monk, an Udi priest. Uh, Udis are descendants, are considered to be descendants of Caucasian Albanians and you know that at a political level, Azerbaijan is trying to promote the idea that uh, these churches are not Armenian and that they are um, a Caucasian Albanian and that they belong to Udi people. And uh, the main claim comes from uh, uh, the following attempt to uh, falsify the facts, stating that after these territories passed under the control of Armenian uh, armed forces, the Armenians started intensively forging some Khachkars and some inscriptions on the walls. However, of course, this uh, doesn't have any uh, basis in the scholarship. And one reason that I can mention is uh, we have uh, several books published in the 19th century, which already attest the presence of these Khachkars and all of the inscriptions that we can find there in the Armenian language. Subsequently, several books were published by the 
Soviet Academy of Sciences, again, uh, with all the inscriptions and all the monuments that contain the Armenian uh, inscriptions and the evidence, the testimony of continuous Armenian presence in these areas for uh, millennia. Um, the the, the Khachka that I want to talk about uh, drew my attention because uh, the inscription here is found in a very unusual place. So this is a late 12th century Khachkar, and the unusual fact about it is that it's quite thick. So if you look in the middle picture, you could see the cross and then a very beautiful ornament at the bottom of it. But uh, the inscription itself is found on the right side of it. And there is another small cryptic inscription at the bottom on the left-hand side of the same Khachkar. Now, um, this, uh, according to uh, the text, and I have inscribed it in capital letters to demonstrate that in most cases, this was done with a capital letter, so it is clearly visible and uh, readable to anyone, um, as compared to, for example, uh, some Islamic monuments where you have more calligraphy used in uh, trying to mix the uh, the ornament and the text together, uh, creating a, a piece of art out of the text. In the Armenian case, it was important to have the text visible so that the names of people who are commemorated by this Khachkar are visible and can be pronounced by um, uh, those who read it. So the translation of this um, uh, inscription goes like this. I, Hassan, son of Vahtang, the Lord of Hatek, and Handai fortress of um, Khachinabert and Havacha Ghats remained in power for 40 years. Fighting many wars, I was victorious over the enemies with the help of God. So as you could see, uh, the author, the sponsor of this um, uh, cross stone, provides some information about the, his earlier life and about his identity. And I had six sons and gave them my fortresses and provinces and came to this monastery to my brother Grigoris and became a monk. Another uh, remarkable uh, uh, historical evidence uh, about this area and about people that lived there. So we can understand that Hassan, son of Vahtang, was a very influential person who had six sons and he basically distributed everything, uh, all his wealth and property to um, his sons. And uh, he decided to come to the monastery to join his brother and become a monk. Interestingly, the main church of Dadivang at the time was not built yet. So it was a congregation of uh, the Armenian monks living there and the church will be built a couple of decades later, the central one. But there are several buildings, so some of them already existed at the time. Uh, the, the building process started from the 9th century uh, until 12th, 13th century. But we also know from archaeological evidence that there was some sort of Christian um, chapel or something uh, similar coming from uh, as early as the first or second century. And uh, the uh, inscription uh, finishes with the following uh, words. And with great effort and many exploits, I brought this Khachakar from Azu and erected the holy sign as a memorial for my soul. This is also uh, quite remarkable that the word Khachakar uh, appears here perhaps for the first time. So before that, we don't have the, um, the, the word, the term itself that appears. Uh, it's not Khachakar, but Khachakar. Uh, however, it's, uh, we, we could say it refers to this particular phenomenon. And uh, the uh, inscription finishes with a plea, with a request, as I mentioned, uh, that there should be a request at the end of it. Now, for your own souls, those of you who will read this, remember me in prayers. And it is followed with a year 631, as I said, according to the medieval Armenian calendar, we had 551 and we get the exact date 1182. Now, the same Hassan, um, uh, 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 Hassan who wrote this thing and asked people to commemorate, uh, uh, to, to remember him in their prayers, uh, 
kind of reminded me what we find in the Armenian colophons. As you could see from this example from a Jerusalem uh, manuscript dated to 1389, a similar plea was made by Armenian scribes at the end of the manuscript. And it's not accidental that um, Patrick also mentioned a similarity between some of the inscriptions uh, that we find on Khachkars and uh, the uh, Armenian uh, illuminated manuscripts. Here again, uh, we see that the person who sponsored the manuscript asks people who would come across this uh, manuscript to read it and, as uh, it says, um, uh, remember, I beseech you to remember me, the sinful Espil, my priest, Grigor, and our son, Johannes, alongside the first recipient of this Sambat and his wife, Tirans, in your sincere prayers. And may God remember those who would remember us. Amen. So we could see here the main function, both of the colophon and of the Khachkar. You ask people who come to worship in the church or in the monastery, and people who stand in front of the sign of the cross, to read this out and in their prayers remember those uh, people who are commemorated on it. This, in the mentality of medieval Armenians, um, seemed to be uh, linked to the idea of salvation. The more people remember the deceased ones in their prayers, the more they pronounce their name, the more chances they would have uh, during the judgment uh, day to find salvation because people were remembering them in their uh, sincere prayers. Uh, going back to the same uh, Khachkar by uh, Hassan uh, in Dadivank, as I mentioned on the other side of the same Khachkar, we find a, a very interesting uh, text. Initially, um, the scholars thought that this is uh, someone uh, very unskilled and uh, who tried to write something, to scribble something there. But uh, Hamlet Petrician managed to decipher the writing and it has a, a fantastic message, I guess, which is uh, still um, very relevant to today. This was written by Hassan himself, uh, the person who sponsored it. And it says, this is the writing of my Hassan's hand, brothers. Stay vigilant. I took nothing from this world. Neither will you. The message that he left to uh, those monks who were there uh, with him in the monastery. Another example that I wanted to uh, talk about is the following uh, Khachkar, again found in Dadivang. As you could see, uh, the inscription is at the bottom of the cross. Uh, now, for some reason, uh, we could uh, say that this uh, was uh, originally positioned in this particular place uh, in the wall of this um, church or the chapel. Uh, however, in some cases, I'm not sure about this particular one, but in some cases, uh, due to some natural disasters or some uh, invasions and destructions that happened in the monastery, quite a few of uh, Khachkars were either destroyed or displaced. And then later on, they were reused in the building of uh, the church or the chapel. So, uh, and it is highly likely that the pedestal on which the Khachkar was standing was destroyed. So uh, those who renovated the monastery decided to include it uh, on the wall. But however, as Patrick mentioned, it could be also originally intended to be placed here. And uh, uh, if we look at the inscription itself, it says year 630, so a year earlier than uh, when Hassan arrived at the monastery. Isarkis, son of Ashot, erected this cross for the salvation and peace of my soul. Those of you who worship, remember me in prayers and God will remember you. Amen. So again, we could see that this inscription also echoes with the colophon and with Hassan's uh, inscription, asking the believers, asking people who stand in front of it to remember them in their prayers. Uh, another uh, example of a Khachkar from Artsakh, from Nagorno-Karabakh, comes uh, from the Koshik Anapat. Uh, uh, it is a very small but 
a beautiful church which is found in the mountains and it is in the forest itself so um, uh, some of the walls uh, are have collapsed but uh, quite a few of the other buildings have survived and uh, I just found this uh, particular picture which uh, is really gorgeous because you could see the person to whom it is dedicated and this person is sitting on his horse uh, holding a lance so and uh, you could see here uh, um, uh, the zoomed image that the text, the commemorative text is written below it. And the date, um, I hope you could see it at the, uh, behind the, the image of, uh, of the horseman. There is the date, usually the date is in, inserted in some other places rather than in the text itself. And uh, this particular Khachkar uh, inscription reads as follows. This, the, the year is 652. I, Lord Gagik, and my brother Grigor, sons of Shahan, erected this cross for our father. Those who worship, remember in prayers. In the previous two cases, we had the sponsors of uh, Hajkars to ask uh, the believers to pray for themselves. In this particular case, we have uh, uh, people who erected the Hajkar in memory of someone else, in this particular case of their um, father. And again, the dates clearly show uh, and testify to the continuous Armenian presence uh, in Nagorno-Karabakh uh, for, for, for many, many centuries. Now, if uh, we want, if we move a bit further west uh, to Nakhichevan, uh, another exclave of uh, Azerbaijan, um, I decided to choose this particular monastery because I have worked a lot uh, on uh, on uh, the colophons that ca came from this. Uh, Supkarapet Church. It was a very big center of Armenian uh, education, established in the late 14th century, and it uh, has a, a fantastic history connected with uh, Catholic missionaries in the area, the uh, Dominicans and the Franciscans, uh, as well as uh, the uh, Armenian Catholics, the Fratres Unitores. So evidence about the existence of this monastic center has been preserved not only in the Armenian sources, but also in quite a few Latin sources uh, and a Latin manuscript, as well as in the accounts of numerous travelers who passed uh, by uh, this area, by Nakhichevan. On the left-hand side, you could see the picture taken by Argam Ayvazyan who had done a fantastic work of trying to preserve the uh, samples of Armenian heritage in Nakhichevan. And most of his, uh, uh, most of the documents that he managed to preserve, the photos, thousands of photos in his archive, they come from the 1970s and 80s. So before, long before the hostilities between Armenia and Azerbaijan started. Unfortunately, uh, as you could see, the church itself was quite intact in the 1970s and uh, yeah, with uh, the bell tower a little bit destroyed, the cross gone at the top of it. However, it was standing and in 2005, an, a British tourist traveling in this area discovered and took a picture of the same place. And as you could see, it has been completely destroyed, demolished alongside all other um, uh, monuments of Armenian heritage that were in Nakhichevan. So uh, Argam uh, Ayvazyan uh, continued the work of Nikolai Mar, which uh, he started in the late 19th and early 20th century during the uh, Russian Empire where uh, different types of archives were collected. So he managed to uh, compare what he saw himself in the late uh, 1970s and the uh, archival documents from uh, Nikolai Mars' expedition in the area. And he produced a fantastic uh, series of several books which uh, contain the description of the Armenian monuments, the description of uh, specific um, uh, small hachkars and tombstones with uh, many pictures which can be found in those books. So 
nowadays this is our only source of information so i chose uh two hatch cards from this uh, period so this one is from his book uh you could see that the photo is uh black and white and it's not of high resolution but it is clear that um the, there is the inscription at the bottom of this uh hatch card this was a uh, placed uh, near the church of surp karabet and the inscription on it reads this Holy Cross is a memorial for the Lord Bishop Azaria and his parents, his father Altundash and mother Paihatun. Remember in Christ in the year 924 of the Armenian uh, era. Um, another uh, uh, Hachkars, uh, several other Hachkars were uh, found also in the cemetery nearby. So um, uh, I've chosen just the two short ones, uh, short inscriptions, as you could see, they attest to uh, the Armenian presence in the area, not the monastery, as I mentioned, the monastery was built in the late 14th century. However, before that, there was a sizable Armenian community, and this was taken from uh, uh, their cemetery. So we could see that in 1204, uh, in that particular place, uh, the Khachkar was erected in memory of Georg, and in the other one, uh, 1155, uh, the the sponsor of the Khachkar asks uh, the worshippers to remember Avet in Christ. Um, I want you. Uh, I want to show this picture to you uh, to uh, point out at one very important uh, distinction. Sometimes uh, even several scholars would confuse the Khachkar with a tombstone. However, as um, Hamlet Petrosian clearly showed, uh, it is very easy to differentiate between the two. So uh, in this picture, you could see uh, still uh, standing Armenian Khachkars of uh, Jura, of Julfa. And uh, you could see that the Armenian Khachkar is standing vertically, while the tombstone is lying uh, horizontally. So one of the first characteristic features is that Khachkar should be standing upright and facing uh, west. However, because of some disasters or uh, because of some invasion and destruction of these uh, monuments, you could also find them lying uh, not in their positions. So how to differentiate? Uh, so it's not only the sign of the cross that is there, but also the inscription tells us uh, that one of them is a, a tombstone and the other one is a hatchkat. So here I have chosen two uh, inscriptions on a tombstone and as you could see, the tombstones primarily refer to the resting place of a certain uh, person. They do not ask people to pray or to commemorate uh, the deceased ones in their prayers. So uh, again, uh, testifying that the Armenian presence in that area since 1981, at least the, 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 the latest one. And uh, with this, uh, I will. Uh, I would like uh, to finish. And here, um, I saw one of the questions uh, before, and just to give you some idea. So we have Argam Ayvazian's work on Nachichevan, several volumes of it. I just uh, used uh, volume four, uh, referring to Yerinjak. Uh, Hamlet Petrosian's 2008 book about uh, Khachkars, their origins, functions, and iconography, as well as semantics, is really very important. Uh, they are both in uh, Eastern Armenian, and I guess it's an, it would be an important task to translate them um, into English. And uh, a few uh, websites, the julfa.com contains many uh, pictures of uh, the Julfa Cemetery that was uh, erased in 2005, as well as the hyperallergic um, research uh, carried out uh, uh, um, a few years ago, and it was presented in another talk uh, by uh, organized by Nasser, which contains a lot of information about the um, uh, the evidence of the existence of uh, these uh, monuments in Nahijevan and how they were uh, destroyed. This also includes satellite imagery. And uh, I would like to finish by uh, just asking you, beseeching you, whenever you come across an Armenian Khachkar, please read carefully the names of people who are commemorated there, and God will remember you on the Judgment Day. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, David. Um, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Very good. Um, I 
leave the some of the questions that have uh, have come up um, in the, the question and answer uh, uh, um, space uh, to be uh, taken later on, as I said, and uh, would now like to uh, um, continue with uh, our third and uh, I must say, unfortunately, a uh, last speaker. Um, um, this uh, Dr. Christina Maranci, the Arthur H. Dadian and Arate Ostomel, Professor of Armenian Art and Architecture at Tufts University, one of the world's leading scholars in Armenian art and architecture. And she published her first book, Medieval Armenian Architecture, Constructions of Race and Nation, with Peters in Belgium in 2001, followed in 2015, and she wasn't idle in between, I can tell you, by the acclaimed um, uh, volume, Vigilant Powers, Three Churches of Early Medieval Armenia, devoted to Mren, Zwartnot, and Petrni. And apart from these landmark books, she is the author of a large number of articles, as well as of The Art of Armenia, an introduction, published with Oxford University Press in 2018, a book that should be prescribed, in my view, in all courses in Armenian studies and art history alike. Today, she will speak on the representation of Khachkars in art, and in particular in the painted Khachkars of Vartken Surenyans. Thank you, Christina, for being with us and giving us your insights. Thank you. Okay, let's make sure this works. How does that look? Looks good. You can see everything? Yes. All right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Teo. And thank you, Mark. Um, thank you to Nasser and the Color School Benkian uh, Chair at Oxford for this invitation. Um, I'm delighted to speak. And today I pretend to be a modernist, but that is not my day job. Um, so I will, um, but, but, but I will be talking about an artist that, that many of us um, know and love and looking in particular at his representations of Khachkars. And I think in a way it will touch on both what Patrick spoke about um, and what um, David spoke about as well with regard to uh, small Khachkars and also inscriptions on Khachkars. So hopefully this will be useful. Um, I can't help but start with um, just a statement that one of the reasons we're thinking about Khachkars today is because of their, um, not just their, their um, role as, uh, focuses for veneration, but as objects of heritage and ob objects of cultural destruction. So I'm showing you a still from the um, video footage of Azerbaijani soldiers, sh soldiers destroying the Jilpa Cemetery, um, which is discussed in the, the hyperallergic article that David mentioned. And then also, of course, some um, the most the, the beautiful Khachkars, not the only Khachkars, but two of the most beautiful Khachkars from Dadivank on the right. Um, just a reminder of what what Khachkars now are facing um, in this, in this, given this political reality we're looking at. Um, but also a reminder that um, UNESCO has essentially made a promise to us about the Khachkars in inscribing them on in, as intangible um, heritage of humanity in 2010. So, um, so they, they have been acknowledged, internationally recognized as, as important um, elements of Armenian heritage. And that's something that was not lost on modern painters, the painters of the 18th, uh, the, of the 19th century and of the early 20th century. And I'm looking here, I'm showing you here um, two paintings by artists a couple years apart. On the left, Yathishe Tadevosian's Worship of the Cross. And then on the right, uh, Surenians' After the Massacres of 1899, both in the National Gallery of Armenia to ask the question, how did modern painters respond to the Khachkar? That is, how did, um, how did modern Armenian painters who were trained very often in a Europeanizing style, um, working in oil on canvas, working with European modes of representation and often painterly styles, how did they respond to this um, object that we think of as a kind of summation of medieval Armenian art of, of kind of linear carving, of interlace, um, objects that were intended not just to be admired, but to be venerated. Uh, these are interesting questions to ask. I pose them here at the beginning of this just to kind of get us started. But I hope you can notice um, even just brief, briefly how Tadevosian's work focuses on veneration 
of a cross and you see the, the monk um, you know, kissing the cross. Um, so we have a kind of living tradition of veneration on the left and on the right we see a cross as, um, as really bearing witness to the carnage in this case of the Hamidian massacres um, because this was one of Serenians' Seren paintings that was painted as a response to the Hamidian massacres. So um, this is just again to get us started on our discussion. So Serenians is known as a narrative painter, as a painter of history, um, just as Khornatsi is called the father of Armenian history, Serenians is often referred to as the father of Armenian history painting. And you see on the left two very familiar paintings to those of us who, who um, love Serenians, um, Shamiram and Ara the Beautiful on the left, and his Ferdosi uh, reading the Shahname on the right. Um, and this is again, just to give you a kind of sense of his style. So he was a narrative painter. He was also a painter of religious imagery. And um, this really takes us from kind of a storytelling, uh, kind of illustrative mode of painting to these paintings that were meant to be directly engaged with and appealed with as sacred. Um, this is made very clear in his Mandelian or Tastarag on the left which is a, in, meant to be that miraculous portrait of the face of Christ. Um, and you can go and see this in the National Gallery. It's kind of, it's placed on a table and you look down on it. And then on the right, you have the mother of God with child, which has been reproduced many, many times. Um, so he was a narrative painter. He was a painter of holy images. Um, he was also a trained uh, artist, trained in Europe. Um, he was trained in Munich and before that in Moscow. Um, so he was trained formally, he was trained in painting oil on canvas. Um, and uh, we can see, I think, in his painting, and many scholars have pointed out that he owes a debt to, um, to the kind of painterly European styles that one often hears words like pointillism associated with him. Um, he was also uh, a student of art history and um, he went to Munich uh, to study art history and art and knew very well um, the history of art in a general sense. He read works like those of Karl Schnaze um, and uh, Vardan Azatian has written very insightfully about um, uh, Serenians' uh, sort of incorporation of Schnaze's theories in his own work. Um, and, of course, I'm sure Serenians was also visiting the Alta Pinakothek in Munich when he was there, which is filled with old masters. Um, and I wonder just, um, you know, in a sense, uh, just myself, um, whether he wasn't informed by some of the nor Northern European painting he saw there, because when I see his work, and I hope I'll show you, I hope th that you'll see it as well, when I show it to you, some of his, the emphasis on detail that he puts um, that he you know, emphasizes in his work, maybe has, a, has an origin uh, in Northern European art. Um, so he learned art history. He was trained as a painter. He also taught art history um, at the Gevorkian Gemaran in Ochmiazin. Um, so we need to remember all this as we look at his um, paintings and at Khachkars in his paintings. And very conveniently, you see three Khachkars right in front. Um, Okay, so for an art historian like myself, Serenians' work is so satisfying because everywhere you look, you find details to be poured over, to be wondered over, to be identified. There is a type of exam they used to give us in the old days in art history classes called the unknown. And the unknown is where you get a work that you have never studied but it is done in a style with which you should be familiar. And somehow I feel like so many of Serenians' paintings are like this. You, you kind of have to look and you have to look carefully to um, figure out what is going on. And so, um, for example, here you have again the, the scene of um, the Chartitze do after the massacres. And you can see, um, I hope you can see the door. Can you see the door as well? Um, with its similarity to not exact, but a similarity to the famous doors um, from Sevan that were recently on view at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Um, so he's interested in detail. 
we can see it as well in this wonderful image of the departure of the procession from Eshmiadzin Cathedral um, on view in the National Gallery. Uh, again, it is a, a wonderful kind of tableau um, showing a liturgical procession, but for if you have an eye for religious objects, whether it's liturgical banners or it's manuscripts or it's incense burners, you can start kind of pouring over and almost cataloging and curating in your mind all these wonderful um, objects. So, um, so this is all to say, I think, that Sereniance was, was an artist, but he was also very much an art historian and his art history informed his paintings. Um, and this is true, I'll just show you one more before we, before we get down to the Kashkars of a detail from the return of Queen Zabel, also on view at the National Gallery. And you're looking here at a wonderful representation of a detail of a mother of pearl door. Um, David, if you can read this inscription, I'm gonna give you a lot of money uh, because that for me, I, that's a tough one. Okay, um, so let's look at some Kashkars of Surenians. Um this, there are a few paintings, and this one is just called Study with Kochkar. It's in the National Gallery. I don't think it's on view because I didn't see it when I was there. Um, but it is fascinating for what it, um, for what we can learn from it. And I'm just going to go forward one more. Let me just see what happens. Yeah. Yes. So here it is. Um, and when I knew that David was going to be giving, um, is it David or David? Do you care? Doesn't matter. <laughs> All right. Okay, I'll call you David. So I'll probably just go back and forth. But um, I tried to read this because I, again, I, with Serenians, I always love to kind of figure out what he's doing. And you can actually read this. It is readable. And that's generally in his paintings, you can almost sort of make out the inscriptions. But then I started looking a little bit lower and thinking, oh, I think I know this. And in fact, it is a recognizable Kachkar. And um, it's, this is it using the skewed perspective tools that you can use on Photoshop. So all I've done is kind of um, opened out the image a little bit more. And for those of you who love Sevan Avank, you will realize that this is basically the same Khachkar. Very, very close. And more than that, it, and it's right here. This is the Khachkar in Savannah Vank. It's the Amena Purgich Khachkar. And if we even compare the inscriptions, David, this is for you. You can basically make out the same, it's the same letters. They're in the same places. And this is in fact the Khachkar from Sevan. Um, from 1563, which even has the maker Todat um, here, you can see. So um, some of this, like, I'm not sure about the Rebecca part, that's how I've seen it translated from this, but I'm, I'm not sure, but I can make out the Hierapet and I can make out the date uh, down below. Um, so in this case, I think we can be fairly sure that Serenians is working from um, a, an actual, probably sketchy made, or he's working from first-hand experience, and we know he traveled to Sevan in 1892. Um, so when we go back to this, uh, this study, we can say it's undated officially, but we can guess that it was made on or after 1892 when he visited Sevan. So I want to thank um, Mark and Teo for allowing me to dive into um, that issue. And now I want to turn to a more famous painting, a painting which is dated and which isn't from 189, that's a typo, it's like I think 1896. Um, but here it is. So this is the Trampled Sanctuary um, and or Vodna Harvat Serpetun. And it shows also this is a response to the Hamidian massacre. So it's a pair painting with the Chartit Hedo painting. Um, and it also features a Khachkar. Um, and I have discussed this painting in some depth. I've uh, re written about it and I've talked about this intense um, interest in detail that you can see. Um, so with the manuscripts, with the incense burner, with the, with the, the altar curtain, 
Um, and uh, the door, the mother of pearl door, the inscription, the icon, there's this tremendous interest in, um, in detail, in a detailed catalog, if you like, of objects. And I've talked about, I've also talked about, and Teo and David, you were there, so you should remember, actually, I think Mark, you were there for another version, but I've talked about this very interesting icon that appears um, next to the Kachkar. Uh, and here's a detail of it, and I've always been fascinated by it, and I've really been struck at the relationship between this, um, all of these figures of the Etchmiads and Gospel from 989, but most particularly the one that is meant to be John, um, all the way on the right. Uh, so I think, you know, my, my theory when I presented this uh, a couple of years ago is that Surenians was, um, either working from a lost icon, which would be a wonderful thing, but, or he was, he knew very well the Etchmiads and Gospels. Um, you know, this is the 1890s. It's a time when Josef Strzokowski was also very interested in the Etchmiads and Gospels. Um, and of course, Suryanyats was at Etchmiadzin, so it would make sense for him to, um, to be inspired by this manuscript. And I think you can see very much that there's a relationship between the two. So uh, why am I going on about um, icons when I should be talking about Koch cars? Um, here I'm showing you detail again of this image of, uh, of, the, of this kind of like pairing of the icon and the Koch car. And here's the detail of the Koch car again. So when um, I was tasked with uh, talking about Surenians' Khachkars, I sort of went on a search for Khachkars because I wanted to do what I usually do with Surenians, which is just locate the model. And um, so I, I tried and I looked at all my usual suspects. Um, I looked at the inscription, which I think, um, David, I get something like Nishanat Asfad, something Hishadag Sarkasi, but that's this maybe. You may have other ideas. I can't figure out what that is. There's also a shine on the, the canvas. But um, anyway, so I just looked at Khachkars. I looked at more Khachkars. I looked at Khachkars for sale. I looked for everything I could see. Where would I find a Khachkar like the one Surenians painted? So I also looked obviously at all my own, um, all my own uh, photographs. And I ended up at Choban um, And I ended up uh, looking at the Gavit, and, uh, which is very famous for its sculpture of um, the portal. But if you look over here, you will notice something interesting. That there is a relationship in particular with this. This is a very uh, unusual form to see for a Khachkar and a Khachkar sort of attached in stone like this to a column. And in connection with this Khachkar, we have something that very closely approaches there's that, but very closely approaches what we have in the Serenians painting. And I'm just gonna give you a little bit to, to time to look at this because it's remarkable how close this is. And it's close to the point where you can compare some of the, not just um, standard forms, but some of the same defects or, you know, look at that. So that's in Havana Vang. This, you see, there's the same kind of semicircular cavity in both. So I think we can be, and what's interesting about this is until now, the assumption was that the trampled sanctuary depicted um, in the interior of Varakavank. And this was an idea of Manya Ghazarian, and it's been perpetuated in the scholarship, although I find no way to uh, square the plan of this interior. Let's go back for a minute. Go all the way back. This interior with anywhere at Varakavank. It's what Surenians has done is taken a portion of Hovana Vank and he has um, turned the Khachkar into a, an icon. So it's, he's looking specifically at this area and then he's turned, this is actually the Gavit, so he's turned this area into the apse which tells us something about his working practices. 
and really isn't the end of the discussion of the trampled sanctuary, but the beginning of it, because we want to think about, well, why did he make those changes? Why did he um, uh, use this particular area in the Gavit for his painting um, and more? So I want to end, this is on the short side, but I want to end just with some thoughts about, um, about Soranians and what I've, I've derived from, um, from reading and thinking about him. So for Soranians, a Khachkar is part of the debris of an atrocity image from the Hamidian massacres. And this is not unlike what we can say about um, Ivazovsky's massacre at Trebizond, which Vazgen Davidian has written so eloquently and powerfully about. Um, like Ivazovsky, Sureniantz focuses on destruction, but unlike Ivazovsky, Sureniantz is focusing us on cultural destruction. And he's doing this 40 years be before uh, Lemkin's definition thereof. Um, and given our current situation, with the, um, the, on the eve of a, potentially of a serious crisis with the heritage in Artsakh, um, Sureniantz's message, his interest, his concerns could not be more apt. Now, Serenians is fascinating for us to think about because he's a modern painter and an art historian. He's staging his scenes. He's modifying some objects. He's staying loyal to others. And also interesting is that he is trained in this painterly style with, with brush strokes that are quite visible. And it's very interesting to see how he handles a, a form of art that is so much about line, and that is Khachkar carving, where the, the kind of crucial thing is line. And it makes me think of the famous paragone, which was common in the Renaissance between disegno and colorito, between line and carving, and between that and painting and color. Um, with his work, the modern aesthetic of painting is tied to the ancient cult of the cross. Sirenians asks us not just to look at an object, but to think about how we are doing that. At least for me, when I look at his paintings, I'm trying to figure stuff out. I'm trying to make sense of, of, of inscriptions that are tantalizingly close to readable. But he also leaves you with the impression you cannot recover the past with any real confidence, but perhaps just enough to be able to recollect and to memorialize. And that should remind us of a Kachkar and the function of a Kachkar itself. So with that, I think I will stop um, share and turn it over to Teo and, uh, and Mark. Thank you very much, Christina, for um, another uh, extremely enriching uh, contribution. Um, Yes, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's fascinating to see um, uh, what, what lies hidden until you start to look. That's amazing. Um, I think um, I'm giving back to Mark now, who will uh, open the question and answer session. Mark. Hey, uh, thank you again to each of the speakers for wonderful, wonderful, deep uh, presentations. <laughs> Uh, that, that complemented each other so beautifully. Um, so I actually first wanted to just share a comment uh, from an audience member because I thought it was a, a wonderful expression of, of uh, the program. The person writes, you have made me fall in love with Khachkars, always had an appreciation, but now they have found a place in my heart, which I think is beautiful. So uh, the first question um, I, I think is for uh, Patrick Donabedian uh, from uh, from an audience member who was from Isfahan, Iran, but uh, was wondering about the location of the Khachkars that you uh, discussed and showed uh, in in Isfahan and New Julfa. Um, you remember I told that I said that uh, in uh, Isfahan in uh, Nord Julfa, Juha, there are three hundred eighty-seven. Uh, pieces 387 unless i'm yes. mistaken um all of them are in or on the the armenian churches of this uh, armenian quarter of, uh, of uh, isfahan 
on or in. Uh, and um, the, 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 our friends, um, Arutyun Khachaturian and uh, Michel Basmajan, who wrote the, the marvelous uh, book on uh, the Hajj House of Jerusalem and of Isfahan, uh, explained very well that, in, in fact, one of the difficulty linked with the study of these, uh, of these uh, 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 small Hajj cars, uh, the fact that they, they are very mobile. Uh, they they uh, they 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 can be they can they can can be be uh, moved from their initial place and put on another one on a new place. Um, and um, for example, uh, there are uh, hash cars which were inside the buildings and were put after outside, and on the contrary also. There are also in uh, Isfahan Khashkars put uh, uh, all, uh, in a group, uh, uh, forming a group of, of uh, a new uh, a new image and put on the facade of, uh, of some uh, some buildings, which is quite uh, unexpected. So. Um, it is a difficult question, and you you have in order to find the the answer, you have simply to take the book, to take the book uh, this one, the book Khashkar. Uh, it is in French, L'Art de Khashkar, Les Pierres à Croix Arméniennes, Dispan et de Jérusalem, and you will see and you will see all the locations of these uh, of these Khashkars together with the plans. They 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 did a marvelous job, our uh, friends. And, and this is very clear. You have the, the plans of the buildings and the place of the Khashkars inside or out, outside the building. Wonderful, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, do I get the next question, uh, Mark? Yes, all right, yes. I, I, uh, here's another question for, uh, for Patrick, I'm afraid. Um, um, you were talking about moving uh, uh, these, uh, the mobility of these smaller Khachkars. Uh, one of the questions was, why did a smaller type of Khachkar develop outside of Armenia? Of course, if that is the case. Um, I, I tried to answer this question, uh, explaining that uh, probably there were reason, reasons why they couldn't or they couldn't uh, 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 create tall khashkars and uh, erect them in, uh, as usually in Armenia, in the yards of the uh, of the monasteries or in, in the cemeteries. Uh, I, I gave some um, possible explanations, among which um, perhaps the main one is that probably there was uh, a will of discretion, you know. In order not to show, not, not to show signs of uh, a foreign cult, which uh, could be uh, not uh, very desirable for the, the environment, or, or perhaps even forbidden from the local, from the side of the local authorities. We do we do not know what was the situation on this on this uh, point. Thank you very much. Um, Mark. Yes, I'm, I'm going to attempt to fuse a couple of questions together here uh, about the uh, what is or is not known about the origin of the form of the Khachkar, uh, its presence, is it present throughout the historic Armenian uh, world, so to speak, and at what point does or or at any point does the art form uh die out as a living form uh and and is it revived at some point or does it have a continuous existence since whenever it originated the form of the khashkar is a, a plate a rectangular plate with the image of the cross on its uh, uh, western side 
is uh, appeared uh, has appeared in the ninth century. Before the ninth century, uh, we do not have such plates. We do not have su such stelas. <laughs> we have other types of monuments standing with sculpted images on them. And among these images sculpted on the stelas, uh, especially uh, four sides uh, stelas, we have a lot of them, there were sometimes and even often the image of the cross. In, such, in some cases, uh, some of these stelas have only the image of the cross. Uh, we can, one can suppose that perhaps this was the base of one of the, uh, this was one of the, uh, of the uh, origin of this uh, idea to create. But there are other uh, possibilities, uh, other uh, uh, hypotheses. For example, we know that there were uh, uh, antique stelas, uh, for example, from uh, Urartu, which were reused by the Christians and transformed into uh, into hachkas. Uh, another hypothesis can be can be linked with the with the um, um, independently standing crosses. We know that in Armenia, um, in the very first Christian period, there, there were uh, crosses, stone crosses, not crosses on the stone on a stone. No, no, just a cross in stone standing. And there were so, such uh, crosses from the very beginning up to uh, the, the, uh, the Middle Ages, uh, even the, the late Middle Ages in Armenia. But the question, the problem was that they were very vulnerable uh, and very few of them remained. But we know that there were, there were such, uh, so perhaps uh, the, the, the Armenian artist uh, or the, the those who wished to express or to show the cult of the of the cross uh, understood that it was preferable. It was preferable to put the image on, on of the cross on a stone plate, than as an in uh, a free cross standing freely like this uh, and being quite vulnerable. So there are so, so several, like this, several hypotheses on the origin of the of the, the form of the Khachkar. But what is clear is that the first, the, the, the oldest Khachkars were not probably not rectangular, totally rectangular, but on the on the contrary, they were round, especially in the upper part. And then uh, around the 10th or the 11th century, uh, this uh, uh, contour of the, of, the, of, the, of the plate, of the stone plate became rectangular. And after this, the band surrounding the cross, which was round in the beginning, became rectangular and larger, more and more, larger and, and larger, and was covered with very sophisticated entre entrelaces especially in the 12th, 13th century. If, my, if I may add uh, to what Patrick said, um, uh, there is uh, the, the, the book that I mentioned by Hamlet Petrosian uh, Khachkar. The first uh, approximately 50 pages are dedicated to the history, the origins of Khachkar. Exactly. You mentioned uh, uh, virtually, uh, exactly, yes, that fantastic. <laughs> um, and it is very interesting. One thing that I discovered for myself is uh, how important was the vision of Saint Gregory that was um, uh, mentioned in uh, Agathangelos' history of the Armenians. How important it was in the creation of the image of the cross, and uh, it, he uh, very importantly links uh, this to not only Armenian but also, of course, Greek and Syriac Christianity as well. So these sort of images were. Um, present in all other uh, neighboring Christian traditions. And slowly in Armenia in the ninth century, they developed into some unique way of um, expressing their cult of the cross. All right, um, uh, thank you. Um, perhaps I uh, can um, bring up another um, question uh, about the formal identity that one sees uh, through time and space um, of uh, of Khachkars. Um, 
makes one of the uh, attendees wonder about um, whether there were schools or regional um, uh, emphasis on uh, on the carving of Hajj cars. Yes, there were, of course, uh, regional schools. Um, and um, probably uh, workshops, uh, although we do not we do not know precisely. There's no uh, precise indication on the fact that there was one teacher and uh, yeah. he had uh, so the uh, pupils. Or, no, but uh, it is obvious that and, and we have inscriptions uh, mentioning the names of the name of the of the sculptor, and um, there are. Uh, sometimes groups of Khachkars bearing the same name during the same period, which shows that there, there were famous uh, sculptors the, who produced a lot of, uh, of Khachkars and probably were very popular and had, uh, of course, uh, students, uh, pupils, uh, learning from them and, uh, and transmitting the, the, the tradition from, from the the master for the teacher to the to the new generations. Thank you, yeah. Mark. Yes, uh, this question, I believe, is directed at Christina, and uh, I'm not going to read it in French, but I think I can translate it from French. Did did <laughs> not uh, did not uh, Arshak Fitvajian also paint Khachkars? Yes. Yeah, I'm trying to think of an example where it's just the Khachkar, but yeah, I just, um, I was just going to focus on Saranians, but it's not to say that the Khachkar wasn't the subject of, stud of uh, you know, imagery for many modern painters, but yeah, um, there were others too. Future grist for your mill. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah one one more question uh, about uh, uh, pedigree and uh, uh, relations um, so taking a few questions together um, uh, how uh, widespread is uh, the let's say the type of khachkar of cross stone perhaps better said more generally um, uh, throughout Christian art, um, uh, one person uh, says, is this particularly Armenian, uh, asks this, uh, and someone else brings up the, um, the comparison with Irish high crosses. Um, mm -hmm. What, what uh, would you have to, to say about that? Christina? I was going to let you take that one. Um, in fact, really, it is a, a, an Armenian phenomenon. Uh, yeah. If we consider, if we take into account the huge number of, yeah. of Armenian uh, stelas with the, the image of the cross uh, that, that are preserved until our days, it is uh, absolutely enormous, uh, something like uh, several tens of thousands. It's incredible. If we consider this, so there's no question. It is, uh, of course, an Armenian phenomenon. But in the principle, of course, the image on the cross on, uh, 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 on um, a rectangular uh, surface of stone or uh, of wood or uh, painted uh, is, of course, something quite natural in the Christian art of uh, the whole world, of the whole Christian world. And, uh, and we find uh, with Byzantine art, many representations of the cross on, on, on metal and, and, and stone and wood. Mm, so, um, of course, it's not, uh, it's not uh, exclusively the, uh, the, 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 an Armenian uh, representation. But uh, from, from the other side, we can, we can see that the Armenians have developed an iconography of the cross on the Khachkars, and especially have stressed the fact that the cross which they represent on their Khachkars is a tree of life, is a symbol of eternal life, and is linked with the, the, the Armenian Christology 
the, the, the fact that for the Armenians, uh, the, the, the cross is the image of the victory, of the victory uh, against death, the victory of life, of eternal life. And it is, of course, linked with the vision that the Armenians have of the nature of Christ. Uh, and the, 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 will, the, the, the willingness of the Armenians to show Christ as, um, as Christ's divine nature, perhaps more than the human nature of Christ. And, the reason, and this is probably the reason why Christ is never represented as a suffering man on the cross, or almost never. When we find such representations, it, it, it is exceptional. It, 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 we, we deal with exception, exceptions that confirm the rule, the rule which is not to show the uh, suffering of Christ on the cross. But only if we show Christ on the cross, it is absolute, it must be an image of glory, of the glory of God on the upper part of the of the plate and never almost never again there are exceptions but but uh, almost never christ uh, crucified on the cross can i um I, I i just would like to add to what patrick said and i completely agree i mean it's hard to think of it as something other than an armenian phenomenon when you look at the numbers when you look at the raw numbers and it, that it, it's it would be hard to argue against it um although now of course uh, given the claims that there is a kind of albanian form that uh, <laughs> yeah that that it makes it important for us to at least remember that what the data shows but the other thing i would say too um, about the Irish High Crosses. So this is a very, you know, it's a comparison that has been long been made between Khachkars yeah. and Irish High Crosses um, and, other, and crosses elsewhere in Europe of this type. And I would say the one thing I find missing from these discussions most, most um, often is the question of liturgy, how, how, these, how these crosses functioned, how they were venerated, how they were used in the landscape. Um, the, the, it's almost always a formal comparison, but, but uh, that leaves out a huge amount of information, a huge amount of kind of historical questions about how these objects were used when they were made. So um, I feel like the question is, has been so far just a formal one, but needs much more in the way of liturgical, social, economic kinds of um, questions, not to necessarily uh, argue for a connection between these two phenomena, but to establish maybe the reasons why they, they look similar, which may not be about connection. It may be about, um, you know, sort of impulses that end up looking the same way um, or conditions that, that lead to, to uh, categories of evidence looking the same way. But it's a, it's a fascinating um, uh, correspondence between traditions. And what is fascinating also with the Khachkars and the attitude of the Armenians toward the Khachkar is that uh, when you stroll, when you, when you walk in the, in, the, in the countryside in Armenia, uh, constantly you encounter the presence of the Khachkar. The, pres the Khachkars are everywhere. And you understand that these uh, people had the intention to mark every meter of their country with the image of the cross. It is very touching. Uh, and this is perhaps what makes the difference with the, the other manifestations of the cult of the cross in the other cultures. It is this uh, popularity, the enormous popularity of the image of the cross throughout the, the, the Armenian countryside, country, the, 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 the presence the, the constant presence of the, the Khashkar in the, the Armenian nature. Thank you. Thank you very much for those considerations, uh, um, uh, Mark. Yeah, I should mention that we have a comment from Professor Petrosian, Hamad Petrosian, uh, mentioning that he has published an article on 
entitled The Similarities Between the Early Christian Armenian Monuments and Irish High Crosses in the Light of New Discoveries in 2012 in the Journal of Indo-European Studies. So interested parties can check that out. And I believe, if I'm remembering right, there there was there's a scholar named Hillary Richardson. Who yes, that's a, correct. Yes, yes. 1985 right. in the Irish uh, Academy yes. uh, um, proceedings. Yeah, yeah. Right. So I, I wanted to return to a question that I, I dumped into uh, the larger question. There you go. You see, everything <laughs> yeah. read from Patrick. Yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Beautiful. Yeah. And and the question is specifically about the 19th century, but I wanted to ask yeah. him also whether the the Khachkar from the 9th century starting point on remains a, a living art form uh, throughout this period up into the current day. And and this the the uh, inquiry was specifically about. 19th century Koch cars specifically. There was a break. Uh, it, 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 the, um, the, the art of Koch uh, developed really um, continuously from the 9th almost up to our days, except during a period, uh, an empty period, let's say, in the uh, 18th and uh, perhaps 19th centuries. Um, I don't know the, what's the reason, perhaps uh, a kind of uh, tendency towards uh, modernity, um, I don't know. But uh, I think, unless I'm mistaken, we have almost no Khashkars in the 18th century and perhaps also in the 19th. And we see again Khashkars in the 20th century. But perhaps, uh, perhaps I'm mistaken, I don't know. Uh, you, you, if there are Khashkars from these periods, 18th, 19th, there are very few of them. If I'm not mistaken, there are a few from the uh, late 19th century while I was searching for inscriptions. They are yes. most, uh, mostly found- Late 19th, the- yes. Yeah, late 19th century, yes. mostly in cemeteries uh, dedi- uh, as, as a, a part of the tombstone. So the tombstone on the ground and the Khachkar commemorating the, the death of the person. And hmm. uh, again, with a similar type of uh, inscription on it. And it's very interesting because now we are uh, witnesses of a, a revival of the art of the Khachkar. And uh, really a very vivid uh, Everywhere you can see that uh, people are creating new Khachkars. Sometimes uh, a little bit uh, surprising, but uh, anyway. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. 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 Um, Good. Um, I let me take another another question. There is a question for Christina, Uh, the person asked, I'm fascinated by the notion that Vart Gersurin Jans memorialized memorials in his painting, thereby producing a new level of memory regarding Khachkars in his own time and ours. I can't help but wonder if this is an artistic version of scribal text copying traditions, with alterations and differences being introduced via editing that result in the same text saying sometimes different things. Perhaps we can see Surin Jan's paintings as visual miscellanies. Oh, that's a that's a very erudite response, and I think Surin Jans would have approved entirely. And we can't forget he was a textual scholar as well as a painter. He translated Shakespeare and Oscar Wilde, and so I think that's a p- particularly interesting response given his his literary his own literary um, traditions, and and something I hadn't really thought about. So that's. Quite wonderful. I mean, I think that, you know, the the idea of what he's doing as a memorial, whether it's like a Hisha Dagaran or like text editing um, or like a Khachkar, it becomes very powerful, particularly I would say when you're standing in front of the painting. And that's something that I only learned when I when I really did do that, not this this year, but the past year, standing in front of the trampled sanctuary is really like standing in front of a Khachkar. It's, these are, this is a massive painting. Paintings are mostly very large. And so you get this feeling 
unlike maybe a, a, a text, you get this feeling of massiveness that um, that I think of I think of immediately as connected to a kind of steely like force. But I love that idea of a kind of a literary idea of a literary memorial as well. So I thank the person who suggested that. Kevin Vogelarn. Yeah. Oh, great. Yeah. 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 Um, yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Mark, I think it's your turn. <laughs> so question for David. David, has there been any effort to, to uh, assemble a complete corpus of uh, Khachkar inscriptions? Uh, yes. Uh, so as I mentioned, starting from the Soviet period on a more scholarly basis, this has been done regularly. So we have the Divan Vimagutian, uh, which is a, a corpus of inscriptions in general, not only inscriptions on uh, Khachkars. Uh, so it's inscriptions on the churches in different uh, chapels, uh, stones and so on. So and next to them, you find quite a few examples of uh, ins inscriptions on Khachkars. And um, this has been done by the uh, Armenian Academy of Sciences, the Soviet Armenian Academy of Sciences. And if I'm not mistaken, uh, some of the volumes were published later already in uh, independent uh, Armenia. They are all in uh, modern Eastern Armenian. And I think it would be um, a very important project to try and make it accessible also to uh, scholars who don't read Armenian. And uh, because they are, uh, fascinating uh, there are fa fascinating stories in there uh, reading the inscriptions seeing how much for example what uh, interested me uh, how much women contributed to uh, building churches and for example in um, Dadivank one of the uh, chapels the domed chapel if I'm not mistaken was sponsored by um, Arzu Khatun, uh, who was a Kurdish woman uh, married to an Armenian prince, and she built that particular uh, ch uh, chapel in there. So there are m many stories, many interesting uh, uh, um, details that any scholar uh, interested in a specific area could go and dig and find uh, something that will provide information about their uh, uh, subject of uh, study, be it a monastery or be it a specific church. And uh, the interesting thing is, and uh, this is closely linked to the idea of pr uh, preserving this and presenting it as part of the Armenian heritage, that uh, this uh, evidence is not just circumstantial. It's not just found in this particular places. We have it in manuscripts. We have it uh, in uh, the travelers uh, um, uh, journals and so on. So. In complex, if you uh, put them together, there are um, lots of uh, books written about this, and we just need to try and make it more accessible to the general uh, public, especially those who can't read uh, modern Eastern Armenian. And uh, just to, um, I would uh, like to thank uh, Robert Dalgarian for this comment. Uh, when I mentioned that Stephen Sim uh, visited uh, the uh, Nahijevan as a tourist, uh, I didn't mean he was just a simple tourist. Of course, he's done a fantastic work uh, in uh, uh, archiving a vast uh, Armenian heritage, both in Nahijevan and in Turkey. But if I'm not mistaken, and um, uh, he had to go there as a tourist because Nahichevan is a closed uh, enclave and it's not easy to get there uh, for a simple person. So uh, I guess that was kind of the, the story. That's why I mentioned uh, that he was a tourist, but he's done a fantastic work. I should mention that uh, for people who want to hear more about that, uh, there is a video on, on Nasser's YouTube page, uh, a program from 12 or 13 years ago that, that Steve Sim participated in, in which he talked about his then fairly recent visit to Nakhchivan and what he found there, or rather what he didn't find there. Uh, Argama Ivazi and Stephen Sim are participants in this program, so you can find that on, on the Nasser YouTube channel, and it's unfortunately uh, rather riveting and dispiriting viewing. I, uh, I would like to, oh, sorry, Patrick, go ahead. No, just uh, in addition to what uh, David said uh, concerning the inscriptions, I wanted to uh, mention uh, the, uh, again to uh, this work done by our friends Harutun uh, Khachaturian and uh, Michel Basmadjan, which is the first step uh, for, yeah. 
the first step for to, to realize an enormous project linked with the wing linked with the, the cataloging of uh, Khachkars, all the Khachkars of all the regions uh, accessible at least and uh, of course in this enormous project the the, the epigraphy the, the the inscriptions are included and uh, we uh, find a good example of this approach in um, part of this book where you find uh, all the texts that are inscribed on the Khachkars. Can you see it perhaps? It's a bit difficult to see, but- Yes, uh, it's difficult yeah. to see, but uh, the, but the, yes. purpose, the purpose of this enormous project is to, uh, uh, to give the text of all the inscriptions of all the Khachkars. And this is the first step uh, in this, uh, the realization of this uh, purpose. Yeah, it is, it is a fantastic project indeed. And, and another, another in, in, in addition to uh, the remark concerning uh, the, um, the existence of uh, um, other forms uh, of Khachkars or forms similar to Khachkars in the, Christian word, we should not we should not re, uh, forget that there are also such forms in Muslim art. Uh, adaptation yeah. of uh, the Armenian khashkars and uh, implementation or transformation in in in, uh, in, in the Muslim uh, funerary art. For example, in uh, Akhlat. Uh, Akhlat, or Akhlat, yeah. Or in uh, a bit uh, in the same region in um, the south shore on the south shore of Lake Van, you find some uh, cemeteries, Muslim cemeteries with stelas, which are very similar to uh, to Armenian khachkars, but they are Muslim with uh, Arabic inscriptions and uh, Muslim uh, ornamentation. Obviously, of course, inspired, inspired by the model of the Khachkars. And and they are huge, aren't they? They they are up to they they are a little meters. bigger, but yeah. not so not so yeah. different. Uh, the, the, yes, no, no, the no, difference they're... perhaps uh, the main difference is uh, the uh, the ornamentation, which is yes. much richer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, it was striking. Um, I, I would like to make one, uh, if I may, one one more remark uh, on uh, from the questions uh, on Surin Jans again. Um, there is another sleuth in uh, uh, in our midst who uh, suggests that um, is it perhaps not a subtle sign that Surin Jans chooses an icon of Saint John, referring thereby to Hovana Vank. Ah. Oh. I, I wish that were so, um, I say to my fellow sleuth, because <laughs> unfortunately the icon can be read. So we know that the icon of Sirenians was actually, he switched it to St. Bartholomew. <laughs> it was, yeah, it's it, not from Sir Bartholomew. So it, it, yeah. It was, it we was too have, simple. We yeah. need to that a little more. It would have been a nice, it would have been very nice. It would have been very helpful, but alas. <laughs> This may uh, not be the last you're going to hear of this, Christina. So. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> right. Well, it, it shows that there is at least one continuation in Armenian culture uh, that is perhaps uh, un, um, unheard of as yet. Um, I think Suren Jan steps uh, in the footsteps of Rigor Magistros, who also wants to give hints that he would rather not have understood <laughs> <laughs> by others. Yeah. Mark, mm -hmm. I think it's your turn well i think we shall we take one more then and then we yes. will uh, okay very good uh and now i've lost my q a um uh so i i know the question came up and i'm, I'm sorry i'm not going to get the wording exactly right because i can't locate it now but one question was about the the western orientation uh of the Khachkars, and the other was I think getting back to what 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 Patrick discussed about the infrequency of the depiction of of the crucified Christ in in on the Khachkars, but not not common, but also not non-existent. So uh, if you could uh, 
any of the three of you speak. Okay, speak to those let's points. let's start from from the second question. There are very few Khachkars on which the Christ is shown uh, crucified. Very few. And these are exceptions. Again, uh, I, I, I repeat, con ex uh, exceptions which confirm the general principle, uh, which is not to show the suffering of uh, Christ on the cross. Um, now, uh, the first, uh, the first question. Uh, can you recall it? Uh, what it's was the about, first question? Uh, facing uh, towards the west. Uh, ah, yes. So fa it's it's exactly the same principle as for the churches. The churches, the Khachkars, the tombs, are oriented, oriented, which comes from Orient. I, uh, it means east. east. Oriented me means turned towards the east. Why? Because uh, the sun sh shines uh, in the morning from the east and the salvation will come from the east and uh, the tomb in the tombs the deceased have to stand up the day of the last judgment they will they must stand up and facing the cross in front of them the cross which is on the, the western side of the stela of the uh, Khachkar. And when standing like this, the deceased will face, will look to the east. That's the reason why the, the Khachkars are oriented, like the, 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 the churches, because in the churches, in the eastern part of the churches, is the apse, and in the apse is the altar. And the believer who stands inside the church looks at the altar, looks at the apse, the apse and looks at the east, because it is the, the path, east, it is the way of the salvation. There are, of course, some uh, exceptions. I think in the previous uh, talk by uh, Nasser, uh, Hamlet Petrosian mentioned that even in Tigran Akerta, in the Christian um, yes. uh, water that we have the entrance the mausolea, yes. The mausolea, the mausolea, it, the, yes it should be the entrance should be from the west towards the west. however it was uh, and uh, it was very nice that he linked it to jerusalem because we have a similar uh, exception there right. as well right there are right. a few exceptions but that yeah technically then you know in the early christian period in uh, the western world also there were a double orientation sometimes uh, some hesitation was <laughs> present. Very good, thank you. Was there another part to that question? I've, I've... No, I think no. <laughs> <laughs> we have answered. <laughs> Very good. Well, last words, Professor Van Lind. Um, well, I, I would like to thank um, everyone involved. Um, I think we had a very uh, um, interesting um, um, uh, discussion after the, the presentations, which clearly uh, roused interest in, uh, in, uh, in the subject. Uh, so I would like to thank all of our speakers, David, uh, Patrick and Christina, as they appear on my screen, uh, rising ever higher. Um, then, um, and uh, again, uh, Mark, for organizing this. Um, um, I hope that we will have occasion to um, uh, to go further into these, uh, into various of these uh, uh, aspects that have been mentioned. There's clearly a lot of research that uh, can still be done, and there is um, the actual uh, need for um, uh, preservation and protection, uh, which um, I have no doubt will be uh, something to work together on in future. Indeed.